just don't want to go there because hell is, is perhaps one of the most beloved notions in Christianity. Doesn't that sound like a strange statement? Hell is a beloved notion. And, and, and yet, I can get you to love hell really quickly, or maybe I can get some of you to love hell really quickly. For example, if you imagine heaven, now that would be the opposite of hell, right? Heaven is the opposite of hell, you assume. So imagine we're in, in, in heaven, and the reason we're in heaven, of course, we're all told as Christians, is not because we deserve it, because of God's grace. So we get to go to heaven. And, and there we are because of God's grace. And we're walking down the street, and, uh, and of course, we, we see uh, uh, Eleanor, and of course, we expect to see Eleanor there, because she's a, she's a nice person, she's a, a good person, and of course, Eleanor is in heaven. And we walk a little down further, and there's Norman. We expect to see Norman, because maybe Norman's not as good a person as Eleanor, but he's okay. And we, we, we even see John Hamill there. And we see John Hamill there because, well, because God loves everybody, you know. Well, we keep walking, and all of a sudden, there's a man with a beard. And it's not Jesus. And it's not Paul. It's not any of those guys. Actually, it's Saddam Hussein. No, I mean, there's a Tony gives me a little surprise. You don't, you don't expect to see Saddam Hussein in. Maybe not, huh? And we walk a little further, and we get over to the, to the, B the Bavaria subdivision, and, and what do we see? Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler's there. And we get over to the Mongolian wing, and there's Genghis Khan. And do you want to see these people in heaven? Not really. Well, why not? It's, it's okay, we're old friends, you can say it. Why, why not? Because they're bad. Come on, just, just say it. Nobody wants to see Saddam Hussein in heaven because he's bad. Nobody wants to say Adolf Hitler in heaven or, I don't know, Benedict Arnold. Is Benedict Arnold going to pass? We, we like the idea of hell because we like the idea of punishment. At least when it's not us being punished. It's an old idea. It's probably not as old as you think it is, but it's an old idea. Now, I, um, let me uh, just start with a story here. Let me start with a story. I don't want to part of my scattered nature, so I'll probably get a little tighter as we get into it. But um, I want to start with a story about a man who decided he didn't like hell so much anymore. A man happens to be a preacher, he's a real person, and I guess I can say his name because he tells the story himself. Uh, a man happens to be uh, named Carlton Pearson. You know Carlton Pearson? Carlton Pearson was a bishop. He was a bishop in one of the Pentecostal churches, and he, he ran what today we call a megachurch. He had a church of thousands of people. And Carlton Pearson was, was, was preaching the gospel. He was a very, very good preacher of the gospel. Beyond being a good preacher of the gospel, he was a successful Christian recording artist. And, and he really was doing very, very well. And he also probably could have been a Christian comedian. He was a hilariously funny man. And um, in addition to all of that, he had a, uh, or has a, a, a loving family. And he was at home one evening after his busy day. And he's at home and he's watching the news with his daughter. And, and it's interesting sometimes how God speaks to us. It's interesting the way the voice of God comes to us. Sometimes it really is a still, small voice. And as he's sitting on the couch with his, his daughter, who's maybe four or five years old, they're watching the news, and, and it happened to be a time when the, the, the Rwandan genocide was in the news. And of course, one thing you know about the modern news is it, it gets pretty graphic. You see the cameras everywhere. And, you know, I guess this is a post-Vietnam era phenomenon. We have cameras taking pictures of everything. And they're watching this, and 
eating their TV dinners, whatever, and they're watching the, the news report from the Rwandan genocide. And the little girl asks her daddy, who's sitting there in his beautiful purple bishop's shirt with a clerical collar on dog at the end of the day. And she asks, the daddy, are all those people Christians? And, and he, he, he thinks about it for a minute, and he realizes in that part of the world, a lot of them are not. As a matter of fact, most of them are not Christians. He says, no, dear, no, dear, they're not. Most of them are not Christians. And she thinks for a second, and she says, oh, are they all in hell now? And he doesn't like where this is going. But there it is. And he asks her, why would you say that, dear? And, and the little girl answers her father, she says, well, Daddy, you've always said that if, if a person doesn't believe in Jesus, they're going to go to hell. If, if they're a good person or a bad person, it, it doesn't matter because nobody's good enough for God. And they're going to go to hell. So I guess all those people are in hell. And Dr. Pearson is considering this, and so we're told, at least, that that encounter with his daughter was the beginning of a particularly long and painful journey for now former Bishop Carl Pearson. You see, Carl Pearson came to the conclusion that, no, those people in Rwanda couldn't possibly be going to hell because, frankly, the world has already put them through hell. And, and he began to reason through Scripture that, actually, the Bible doesn't teach hell at all. And that, actually, if there is a hell, it's not for eternity, and it's not a place that people will spend. Carl Pearson's story ends by him being kicked out of his denomination and being defrocked for heresy. Because the denomination could not allow a bishop to teach that human beings are not sent to hell by God. Now I'll tell you another story, maybe a slightly more personal story, and, and it, it is about my childhood, uh, or at least my young adulthood, and of course I'm in a Lutheran church, and I'm being confirmed, or about to be confirmed, so I'm about 13 years old. And we're sitting in confirmation class, and in those days, those days I say as if the word is becoming a very long time ago, confirmation class was a lengthy course, several years. It was intense. And we're, we're winding up the course, and we've studied Luther's small catechism, and we've gotten into the large catechism, and we've memorized all kinds of things from the Bible. And one of the, one of the students puts his hand up and asks the pastor a question, and the pastor happened to be Joel Janza, I mean, this not mean anything to you, but it's a name I think of several times a day, because he was incredibly influential on me, so if you're out there, Joel, thanks, man. And uh, seriously, um, he was the one who encouraged me to, uh, to learn to read Greek. Um, the, the student asked Pastor Joel, is there really a hell? And Joel says, of course there's a hell. Why, it says so right in the Bible. And the student wanted to know, well, what's hell like? And you can tell that Joel did not want to answer the question. So he tried to demure it to, well, well, what are you worried about? You believe in Jesus, you're not going there. Well, by the time you're 12 or 13, you're very curious and you're beginning to develop a lot of cognitive reasoning abilities. So the young person said to Joel, I know that pastor, but I have a lot of friends. And some of them are Jewish, and some of them aren't sure what they believe, and some of them are even atheists. And I guess when you say you're going to hell. So I just want to know what's it like. So Pastor Joel takes the bait and he 
tries to describe hell. And Joel's description of hell will remain with me to my dying day. Joel said that, have you ever been burned? Have you ever burned your hand on a stove? Or in those days, many people spoke. Have you ever accidentally been burned by a stray cigarette that was lit? And of course, by this point, most of us had. We knew what that was like. Imagine, said Joel, that feeling all over your body. Every inch of your body burning. Quite unlike in life, where that would really happen, you might live for a minute or two and then pass out from the pain and other things. This would never end. This would go on for all eternity. Not just for a year or ten years or a thousand years or ten thousand years or a trillion years. This would go on for all eternity. And this is a picture of hell that I grew up with. And it's a picture of hell that a lot of people have. And we hear this expression a lot. We have said this to someone. You know, if, if I were really angry at Norman when he stole my bully salad, Norman, you're going to burn in hell for that. You ever said that to somebody? Maybe you won't admit it. Have you ever thought that about somebody? So here we have two very, very different viewpoints from the, the clergy. And I, in my arrogance, or my naivete, or both, thought maybe I could come to a conclusive scriptural doctrine on this. Just lay it to rest once and for all. And not unlike our discussion about soul consciousness versus soul sleep post-mortem, I discovered that there were a lot of verses, especially if I disembodied them, that I could take as a positive indication that there's really a hell. Like the one I just read to you was our first lesson. That little piece from the 20th chapter of Revelation. Lots of verses that suggest there is a hell. And just as many, by the way, that suggest that there isn't. After all, on the one hand, we hear about Jesus separating the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the chaff, and those verses are often taken to indicate who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell. On the other hand, we also hear in Philippians and other places that in the fullness of time, every eye will see him. Every knee will bow. And every tongue confess. So on the one hand, we have Revelation saying that those who didn't do good works can cast into the lake of fire. And then we have Philippians and several Old Testament sources, by the way, suggesting that in the fullness of time, everyone comes into the presence of God and worships Him. So, which is it? Do we just leave it alone as this strange Paradox? What I want to suggest to you, what I want to suggest to you is that, and maybe it's the same thing I've been suggesting for the last three years here and two years prior to that, the road of first press, when we encounter scripture, when we encounter scripture, we need to look at it. Let me give you three things. Two of them you've already heard me say a lot. Cultural humility with spiritual humility. Everybody understand what I mean by that? Cultural humility. Not trying to impose our culture on something written 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago. Spiritual humility. Recognizing that maybe it's not something wrong with the text, it's something wrong with us. Let me add a third one that I want to borrow from St. Francis. If we take the nature of God if we take the character of God to be compassionate, then maybe every scripture verse we look at, we should not leave until we find a compassionate interpretation. The nature of God is to be compassionate. Maybe his words are compassionate. And if we can't find compassion within the text, maybe we need to wrestle with it until we either find compassion in the text or maybe we just need to put it aside and not try to make a doctrine out of it. 
Some of you may be aware of this, and, and, and I know that most of you, if not all of you, are on the opposite side of this equation, but it's no secret, and there's no polite way to put this, it's no secret that a significant portion of the Christian world is, is hung up on the issue of alternative lifestyles. Is that news to anybody here? Okay. You know, there's a, there's a big debate going on. Should homosexuals be allowed to be clergy? Can you be gay and even be a Christian? Jimmy Swagger, remember Jimmy Swagger? Jimmy Swagger used to suggest that homosexuality was the worst of all sins. Worse than murder, worse than. Have you ever had followers? I don't believe that. Well, a story is told of a particular Christian. I'd like to pepper the story and tell you he goes to Westboro Baptist Church, but, but I don't know if that's true. A particular story is told of a Christian who, who decided that he so detests homosexuals, so hates gay people that he was going to find in the Bible the passage where gay people are condemned. And, and so he does. It's right there in Leviticus 18. You can look this up if you want to. Leviticus 18. And, and he decides that this is such a, a hugely important thing to him that he decides he's going to tattoo it on his arm. He's going to tattoo that verse on his arm. Right there, he starts in, in beautiful Beautiful kind of gothic script. The tattoo artist has been brilliant, writes this on his arm. The man who lays with another man as a man lays with a woman shall be put to death. And there it is on his arm. So when he wears his white Peter t shirts, everybody can see it. Unfortunately, we forgot to look to Leviticus 19, where tattooing is prohibited. This is an example of what happens when we, we look to Scripture with our own particular cultural lens. We, we find what we are looking for. So today what I'd like to do is to um, take you to another place where we hear about fire. It's the second lesson. The second lesson today where we hear about fire. In Luke 12, at verse 49, Jesus begins, I wish the fire already kindled. And then he goes on to say, you think that I have come to bring peace, but not so. I have come to bring division. Now, the same story, by the way, exists in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 10, although there it's, it's even harsher, because instead of division, Jesus says, I have come to bring a sword. And I'm going to tell you that as a preacher of peace, as a pacifist, I, I find that disturbing. I find it difficult. You know, I, I, I like to think of Jesus as the ultimate peacemaker. Hmm, don't, don't you? Don't you like to think about Jesus as the bringer of peace? I thought he is the, the prince of peace. I like to connect Jesus to the, the suffering servants. The one who will not have bruised reed break. And, and, and here we hear this verse of Jesus who's come to bring division, or in Matthew's version, come to bring a sword. The only way I think that I can explain it to you, the only way I believe I can possibly explain it to you, is, is if I take you back to my own experience with that verse. And I'll try to do it succinctly. You know, I, of course, grew up in the in the Lutheran church. And, um, you know, they, they say this about Lutherans. They say it about Presbyterians, and a lot of denominations, all the old white denominations, claim this, this honor, or do be this honor. We are called the uh, frozen chosen. Any Presbyterians here ever called the frozen chosen? The Presbyterians are. How about Anglicans? Anglicans are here too. Anglicans get called the frozen chosen. I guess it's a lot of frozen chosen. Well, if you all were the frozen chosen in my Lutheran church, we were sub-Arctic. You know, penguins and polar bears would have felt comfortable walking up the aisle. It was, and it's not that they were not people of faith. Don't get me wrong. I know, because some of those people who listen to the sermon, they, they, were, they were not lacking 
didn't pay. It's just that I was a teenager. And, and, and I was a teenager who was, I don't know what was wrong with me exactly, but I, I, I got into the God stuff. Maybe I was just a geek. I, I don't know. I, I love the Bible. I, I love church. And, and I wanted it to be real and big and exciting. But it wasn't in my little Lutheran church. So I went elsewhere. I went elsewhere. I don't know how many of you know this, but I do. I went elsewhere, and, and where I went, first was the local charismatic church, and, and then the Pentecostal church, and that's probably where I developed this preaching style, by the way. I, I went to the Pentecostal church, and, and there I got born again. You know, the whole the whole thing, born again, baptism in the Holy Spirit, the whole thing. I gotta tell you, it changed my life. Completely changed my life in all kinds of ways, not necessarily all of them immediately good, but it changed my life. And it changed something else too. It changed my relationships. And all of a sudden people started saying to me, Man, you're getting weird. Can you imagine people saying that to me that I'm weird? That's okay. They really thought that I was very, very strange, but that I would do things, you know. I would do things like, I'm in the Bronx High School Science. That's probably about, you know, Bronx High School Science, you know, future nuclear physicists and all this. And I'm walking down the hall carrying a Bible over my arm. You know, then we're in a sitting in the student cafeteria, and we're about to chow down before, you know, AP calculus. Uh, we need to give thanks. People looked at me like, Man, you're just getting a little strange for us. And because of that, any of you have an experience like that? You know, it doesn't even have to be about religion, by the way. Sometimes that happens when somebody's single, and they're single for a long time, and they're hanging out with the old gang. It could be a man, it could be a woman. You know, you're single, and, you're, and all of a sudden you find somebody. And everything's different. All of a sudden you change, you change everything. And your old friends say, you're, you're kind of weird now. You can't go to the same places, you can't stay out late, you can't tell the same kind of jokes. It, well, I thought I understood that verse. You know, remember the verse? The one about division. I've come to bring division. Especially when Jesus begins to look at this most sacred of all things, the family. He begins to talk about fathers against sons and mothers against daughters. Man, I thought I understood that. Man, I really thought I understood that verse. Yeah, that's what happens. You know, you give your life to the Lord. That's what the expression you use. Give your life to the Lord. You give your life to the Lord. The grace that everybody's against you. And you got the vision. It's, it's interesting the way the Holy Spirit teaches you. It's interesting that as we become more mature, we realize that we really do have to put aside childish things, and sometimes the childish things are our beliefs. So, I realize realized eventually that's not at all what Jesus is talking about. That kind of division? You see, Jesus says, I'm going to bring the division. And those divisions, they're not divisions that Jesus brings. They're divisions we make. Or maybe the world makes. Or our friends make. But they're not God's divisions. They're ours. We made those divisions. And I'm not saying it isn't a real experience. And it may even be an evil necessity. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. You see, Jesus says, I want fire. I want fire. Of course, there's a, there's a waggish part of me. There's a cynical part of me that looks at the world and opens the paper. And, and, and is tempted to say, especially when we hear of events like the Friday of Anger, Okay, you got it. It's all on fire. Are you happy now? I know it sounds blasphemous, but it's tempting. I want fire. Here, here it is. But Jesus is talking about fire, talking about division, and the, the opposite of what Jesus is talking about, the, the, the polar opposite of that appears to be, well, peace. It appears to be peace. But here's the 
here's why it's important, at least one of the reasons why it's important not to encapsulate things. You see, if we take the story by itself and we don't connect it to anything else, it could be a pretty horrible little vignette. It could be Jesus on a bad day. Jesus wakes up on the wrong side of bed. Jesus left his sermon notes at home and is just bam. I don't know. But if we begin to connect it, we realize something about peace. The world's peace and God's peace are two different things. They are, in fact, diametrically opposed. You see, when the world says peace, what it really means is sameness. You know, some people are going to say, but I really think that's true. When the world says peace, it means lack of differentiation. For example, in one particular corner of the world where they're doing things like celebrating the Friday of anger, the crucial issue really comes down to the fact that people do not believe the same things. They do not hold the same values. And certainly one way to bring about peace would be to insist that everyone have the same beliefs. Everyone dress in the same kind of clothing. Everyone hold the same values. Some months back, many months now, a, a young man in a part of the world not far from where he and I would be lost his life. Essentially because of too much differentiation. He didn't look like he belonged. I really wish it was something more profound than that, and I will never say that the man who lost his life, and you all know who we're speaking of, was any kind of an angel. Let's face it, he wasn't. We know that. But essentially, though we don't know the facts, though we can't know the facts, there are only three people who know the facts. One of them is God, one of them is dead, the other one's not talking. Whatever happened, one man lost his life, another man's life was ruined, and two families were devastated. And it happened because someone was in the wrong place at the wrong time, did not look like they belonged there. Wrong clothing, wrong skin tone. So the world makes peace. If you stay in over there, and you stay over there, there'll be peace. The world enforces peace through violence, or through the threat of violence, or through psychological or spiritual violence. We bomb nations. We kill people. In the words of one Roman general from many, many years ago, we create a desert and we call it peace. Not even go so far as to use the example of obvious violence. We surely could have, there was enough of it in his day. Maybe even more than we have, if you can imagine such a thing. Jesus goes right to the heart. Jesus takes his sword and he stabs right to the heart of something so very sacred. The family. Did, did you catch that? Jesus is talking about the family. And here we have to go back to our cultural context, brothers and sisters, the family. Now, you may have grown up in an idyllic family, or, or not. You may not have had any family strife, or maybe you did. But I'd like to suggest to you what family meant in Jesus' day. Were there families that were happy? Oh, of course there were. Were there families that were dysfunctional? Oh, of course there were. But here's what family meant. Family meant that the wives and the daughters subjected their wills, their desires, to the desires of the husbands and the sons. Well, that's just cultural. That's just the way it was. And by the way, if you want to keep peace, you don't change that. You don't, you know, if you were a girl in those days, your education went so far as to be able to cook and clean, maybe a table prayer or two. Chances are you've never been taught to read, let alone to write. And you wouldn't have 
that we would be expected to be out in public. Can you cook? Can you clean? Can you dress modestly? Good, you're going to be married off by the age of 13. And that was the life of the woman, subject to the will of men. And then again, the lives of the people, subject to the subject to the will, the whim of the local government. The local government subject to the whim or the will of the larger government. We call that peace, but Jesus didn't. Because you see, Jesus, I believe, knows something about us. It's not just us here, but about humanity. Each of us is created in God's image. Sometimes that's a little scary for me. I look in the mirror and I think, wow, so that means that God is an overweight, slightly offensive priest with long hair. Um, well, probably not. But I am created in God's image. At least when I put aside the sin of old Adam, and so are each of you. And an infinite God seems to be pleased to make infinite variety in his creation. I have it on pretty good advice that even twins are really not all that alike. That's what God does. He creates individuals so that he can put them together into communities. But the world creates sameness. The world would take away your individuality. The world would tell you to be like the person next to you, like the person next to that one, like the person next to that one. It's, it's not just governments, not even just families, the culture itself. You remember, some of you at least, when you were teenagers or a little younger, you decided you had to rebel. All the rebellion took the place of weird clothing. And you wore the same weird clothing that all your friends wore. So you expressed your individuality by being like everyone else. But that's the peace that the world attempts to give. And Jesus rejects that. You see, we can try to create peace this way. We can try to create peace at the point of the bayonet are at the wrong end of a bomb. But it will never work. Oh, we may create the kind of peace that you find in a graveyard for a while. But we'll never find that peace that comes only from Christ. We will never have that peace of Christ until the old systems are dismantled. We cannot fix the ways of this world because they're based on the wrong stuff. They're made of the wrong stuff. So Jesus brings vision. The very nature of Christ, the very nature of his teachings, dismantles all the sacrificial systems of this world, takes it away, and what's left are ever more subtle divisions to collapse. We're seeing it happen all around us. We're seeing the divisions disappear. And sometimes they disappear with violence. Sometimes they disappear with great pain, but they are disappearing. And when that happens, when that happens, a new peace, a real peace, can be built in its place. Maybe together we can be 
begin to understand the character of God. We begin to understand the nature of God. How does a loving God act? How does a loving God treat his children? How does God deal with the world that he himself created? We'll talk more next week. Stand and confess our faith in the words of the Apostle Church.